Welcome to Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. This is a very special episode. We recently ventured to Brandon, Manitoba amidst the buzz of the 2024 Association of Manitoba Municipalities Conference. Amidst the vibrant energy of the event, we seized the opportunity to engage with local elected leaders hailing from across the province of Manitoba. Though this episode may be briefer than our standard episodes, its significance remains undiminished. We delve into the pressing issues confronting communities firsthand, amplifying the voices of municipal leaders and offering insights into the diverse challenges faced by local governments in Manitoba. So we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring the municipality of Swan Valley West, Reeve, Bill Gade. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Bill, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by asking a simple question, but it's a straightforward one. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Gosh, you know, I have wanted to do it for a while and thought about you know, politics. I've been following politics for a long time in my day job. And so as you get into that more, you start thinking, gee, you know, sometimes these people could use some help. <laughs> and I don't know, we try not to take shots at the municipalities, we try not to take shots at those that come before us. But sometimes you see people in politics that maybe don't know how to write a bylaw. They don't know how to run a meeting. They can't follow the municipal act or even know there is one. And so you get sometimes those situations where you see it and you're like, this just grates on my nerves. I could do a better job than this. And not just me do a better job, but our community could do better. If we had someone that could do those things and had it working better, we'd do so much more for everybody. So what was it about the municipal arena? Because you, <laughs> I, I've heard that exact same sa statement about federal, provincial politics, um, federal and provincial governments. But you said that the best way for Bill to help make a difference in his community, in the community of his neighbors, would be around that council table. What was that decision based on? So federal, I think, was just out for me because I, I don't speak French. <laughs> I don't think I could learn French. So that's problem number one for federal politics. Not that it's not interesting. I'd love to be in Ottawa. I've been there many times. It would be great. But I know in Ottawa, I'm not going to accomplish anything huge because I'm going to be one of a couple hundred people. I'm going to have a party leader that tells us what to do. And the first time I open my mouth and say something I shouldn't, I'm going to be out. And that really applies to provincial politics too. Unless I happen to be the premier, and I don't think Mr. Canoe is in the mood for that yet, um, then what am I going to accomplish? I'm not good at following the leader. When I have an idea, I want to say it. Sometimes I say it a little too loud. Uh, and so municipal politics is some place where you can have that input. Even when you're just a member of council, you can have input. Rather than just being told on Monday morning, this is what our party is going to do this week, you actually get to be part of those decisions, I think, more than in the provincial realm. Really? I, I, it feels like it to me. I've known a lot of MLAs, and I've known cabinet ministers, and cabinet ministers probably get into that. Yeah. But if you're not a cabinet minister, your job is to show up, vote when you're told to vote, and go home. So it brings up an interesting question a little bit here, because as Reeve of your community, you have X amount of constituents and every single one of them, even if they voted for you or didn't, they have your ear. You go and they probably know who you are and they're going to be pulling you in every single different direction. 
How do you, and I say you as Reeve, and make the decision that is in the best interest of the entire community and not just the small group of people who might agree with you or disagree with you or uh, support you in that echo chamber that we are so often finding ourselves in? I think that's a real danger. You see that happen to a lot of heads of council where they have five or six people that they listen to and to the exclusion of everybody else, and it's tough. I don't think you can do the job with a lot of experience. When I was first elected to council, I was heard to say, I could have just run for Reeve. I could have been Reeve first try. Why did I bother being a councillor? And after four years of that, when I got elected Reeve, I said, holy crap, was I wrong. There is no way I could have been a good Reeve without sitting there for four years first. And the same thing for the rest of that. I don't think someone that's the head of council should be there until they have some idea of how not to fall into that trap. Because you see it a lot of times a group of five or six people that they're friends with and they run the policy but there's thousands of other people out there and you certainly hear it maybe more now than other times with Facebook with all the social media and you know it's hard to convince people to be in politics because of all that noise but at the same time not everybody's wrong on Facebook some of the stuff they're saying is probably right and you should be paying attention to it because within every keyboard warrior there's also some people that are just trying to make their community better so if you listen to everybody, it doesn't take long for reasonable people to figure out what's best for the community. Do you find there's an apathy within the, your community? Because and I'm going to make sure I read it, read it off your nameplate because I said I'm going to mess it up and I don't <laughs> want to mess it up and I feel like I'm going to mess it up. But do you find that there is a apathy within the municipality of Swan Valley West? Because when I speak to municipal leaders, not only here in Manitoba, but across Canada, and I, I'm painting a very broad stroke here and I do apologize whenever I do this, but I think it's it's becoming apparent to me that more and more people are tuning out of what's going on at town hall, at city hall, at the county hall, and they are more politicized at the federal or provincial level, but municipally, the old adage is, if my water turns on and my stru uh, street is paved or my street is plowed when the snow falls or the garbage is picked up, I really don't care what's going on. In your community, do you find that people are actually engaged on the issues that are in the municipal jurisdiction more than most okay and we had a time they weren't if you go back a couple elections ago you were struggling to find people to run for council you were seeing acclamations happening and then we had some rough times there were some times at swan valley west that weren't pretty you know we started to make headlines for all the wrong reasons and that gets people interested again mm. uh, and it's been a struggle. Like I've been Reeve for coming up on two years. How do we engage those people? So we're trying some new and different things. I'm trying some new and different things. Even my council doesn't always, like we, we videotape our meetings and we were having 10 people watch those. We're up to 250. Wow. So if 250 people watch a municipal meeting, something's going on. But you know, our secret is we're telling people what's going on. Our meetings run two hours and half of them are me explaining every single thing we're doing so that people know. We're sending out little books twice a year you know, 16, 20 page books of here's all the things that are going on and not just pat us on the back, we did something. Here's the things that didn't go right. Here's the things that went wrong. Here's the things we tried and failed. Here's what we're gonna try next time to try and keep people engaged. The most recent one we did, we put the number of hours every grader has on it in the book because what farmer at a coffee shop doesn't want to read about how many hours are on the machine? And suddenly, instead of people saying, oh, you don't need a new grader, they're coming up to us and saying, that one is really old. Don't you think you should replace it? Uh, and so it's just engagement. And they, they want to be involved. And it sounds like it's looking outside the box because I had never heard of that before. And this is an interesting experiment just in itself. But you have connected municipal issues with the average resident. You have talked to them in the language that they understand. Hours for mechanics or for machines, which every farmer, and I've spoken to many, I've lived on farms, every farmer knows that it, there's a lifespan of each machine and it, it's, it, it's quantified in the hours. And by doing that, you are, and I don't want to say in essence dumbing it down, but you are making it easier for people to understand what the issues are facing. I'm going to ask the stupid question right now, but is it working? I think it is. So let me give you an example. We're building a CT scanner right now in our hospital. Yeah. And that's a big deal for us because we haven't had one. Is. two hours to the nearest CT scanner. So we've had people die because we don't have a CT scanner. We set out to say we want one. Well, it's costing us a million dollars between our four local governments, which is a lot of money for us to come up with when healthcare isn't one of our responsibilities at all. But we're coming up with the money. People weren't always on board with that. 
we were looking for community fundraising. So we said to the community, please help us raise $100,000. Because, you know, we can take it out of taxes. We prefer not to. If we can have more affluent people donate some money, why charge everybody for it? It wasn't going very well. Lots of people said things like, I don't understand why we need a CT scanner. I don't know why we're fundraising this. Can't you just put on our taxes? So we spent some time doing education. Why do we need a CT scanner? Why do I want one? And so I told people as vocally as I could, in the books, in the media, anywhere I could, I don't want to go and sit with another family and explain why their family member is dead. Because that's one of the Reeves' jobs. When someone from the community is dead and they come to you and say, Bill, why did my loved one have a stroke and die because of it? Because they couldn't get to a CT scanner in time to be treated. That's my problem. Everything's the Reeves' problem. And once you start telling that story and telling people why it's important, a few weeks later, we have groups fundraising for a CT scanner. First off, that's a lot of weight to put on someone, someone's shoulders. And I can only imagine the pressure that you feel when you have to go knock on that door or go talk to that family member who has lost somebody. Can I ask the stupid question a little bit here? Sure. How do you deal with it? Yeah, from a personal level, because I can imagine that weighs on you, and you've only been read for two years. And when you were just talking about that, there was a, an emotion in your voice that said that it is a struggling job from time to time. Sure it is. Being a Reeve, if you're doing it right, is the hardest job on earth. Because no one, like we talked about Mr. Canoe, no one goes up to the premier for more than 10 seconds and has that conversation. Yeah. Whereas when you're the Reeve, that might be an hour-long conversation having coffee at the kitchen table. You're, you're that much more connected to everybody. How, how hard is it for you to run and grab milk? For <laughs> I, have, I have teenagers. They refuse to go shopping with me anymore because they're like, Dad, there is no way it can take an hour and a half to get milk. But it does. <laughs> So I want to turn to the municipality as a whole. But before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it by saying this. This is a conversation between you and myself. This is not a motion of council, a direction of council, or a policy of council. Mm -hmm. That being said, what do you believe is the biggest challenge facing the municipality of Swan Valley West? I was going to say Swan Valley East, but I didn't. But what is the biggest challenge that you believe is facing your community today? You know, the easy answer is roads or infrastructure or any of that stuff you hear from everybody. I don't think that's it for us. I think our biggest challenge, we live in a geographically remote area. You know, we're in a valley where we're two hours to the nearest everything. If we don't have it in our valley, it's a long way. That is the biggest advantage I've ever heard of. We all see it as the biggest disadvantage. And our challenge is changing the mindset, not only of council, but our entire community. We are in an amazing part of Manitoba. People fight to get to come to be where we are. And if you've lived there all your life and you had to drive two hours to a Walmart, you think, oh my gosh, two hours to a Walmart. Yet, look at the diversity and the things we have because of it. There are people out there that would kill to live someplace that's two hours from a Walmart, but still has everything. That has a pool, that has a, you name it, we've got it. We just don't have a Walmart because we're just a community unto itself. I don't, to me, the economic development thing is our big challenge. How do we get our locals, not the other people? I can go to cities all day long and talk to people that want to move and want to build businesses in our community. How do I get the locals motivated to think it's a good idea? Because I still have people that come up to me and say, I don't know why you're wasting our time trying to grow this community. Shouldn't we just let it die? Well, let's change that attitude because that attitude will let it die. So, so how do you do that? Because economic development is a multifaceted approach because it is not something that just the municipality can do alone as well. It's There needs to be buy-in from the business community. There needs to be buy-in from the residents. There also needs to be buy-in from the, uh, the federal and the provincial government because they need to invest in infrastructure, which comes with a growing of a population or growing of a Walmart in your community. How do you diversify your economy? How do you grow your economy and make it a place where people don't say just let it die you know we have a dirty little secret <laughs> we're not broke and that you know in the municipal world you don't say that too loud because people come with their every hand municipal out. leader who is listening to this right now is looking up your community and yes. going how can i sue them yeah, i know right <laughs> we I, 
I see a lot of people. So we've been working on the healthcare challenge. And to yeah. us, you know, we're chasing after this, train our own people. Because if you're from here, you probably stay home. So let's train the people from home. We're training our own doctors. We're training our own healthcare aides. And I met with uh, the head of a university and they said, do you realize you're the only place that's ever come and says, we have this much money sitting in a reserve fund to increase our healthcare back capacity and we're not sure how to spend it? But those are the problems we have. So it's like, People before me planned for these things. I have a million and a half dollars sitting in a fund to expand our health care in our area. Okay. Not a lot of communities say that. So our challenge isn't what everybody else's is, which is go and find, try and find $3 for it. Our challenge is, so we don't want to waste that. We have it collected up. What are we going to do that's amazing? And it's the same in economic development. You know, when I became Reeve, we inherit an economic development group that has money in the bank, but no staff and no action. Yeah. Well, what are we going to do to use those resources really well? And that's what we've been working through the last year and a half. So this is the first time I've ever been able to ask this question because you claim, which I take you at face value, that you have money sitting in the bank. You want to use that appropriately, which is fantastic, and I appreciate you saying that. But here's the caveat to that. Every single person in your community will have their idea what is the best commute best thing to put forward whether it be an upgrade pool whatever be you say you have a pool but there's always that upgrade that service level they need new paved roads things are getting more and more expensive as we talk literally we look outside yes. and gas prices have rose two cents since i've been here mm -hmm. in brandon broadcasting but you now have to come up with a uh, plan that's going to please the majority of the people, understanding that you're never going to do that <laughs> in municipal politics. How do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individual to address the individual concerns and make sure that they feel like their tax dollars are being spent wisely and that potential, that pot that you have? You talk to them. You keep talking to them. because when we don't rumor takes over so you, you keep talking to them the more you can tell people the better you, you and i both know if you have one person in a room and you tell them a story they'll probably come up with a viewpoint on what should be done and reasonable people one-on-one -on -one can do that mm -hmm. the problem comes when we have one council talking to three thousand people or worse yet not talking to three thousand people so we pass the resolution without ever speaking to anybody we don't tell them why we made the decision well, what's going to happen next, except everybody's angry. Um, I look back to the AMM here a year ago, we were in Winnipeg. And so we are, in theory, the cream of the cream of our communities. We're the people that are elected to lead, to show direction, to make sure our communities do well. So they made a change to the conference. They changed the trade show from two days to one day. And they told us, they put up a sign that said the trade show is only today. There's no trade show tomorrow. They put it in the book we get. They put it in the emails they sent out. They announced it at the stage every hour, just so you know, there's no trade show tomorrow. So after sitting through that all afternoon, I say to the guy beside me, I'm gonna go check out the trade show today because I don't want to miss it. And he says, well, I'm gonna go tomorrow. Well, I said, there's no trade show tomorrow. Well, yeah, he says, there's always a trade show for two days. No, no, I said, they've been saying, there's no trade show tomorrow. Well, he says, I'm sorry, but there's always a trade show for two days. I'm going to it tomorrow. And I said, well, whatever, I can't save the world. <laughs> It wasn't for my municipality, so I went to the trade show and had a great time. So the next morning, for fun, I went and stood at the doors to where the trade show had been. And 200 municipal leaders came to those doors, couldn't understand why they couldn't get into the trade show. Why is the door locked today? That is a matter of communication, and communication is not easy. If we assume it is, we are the next council to get voted out because, oh, they never told me what's going on and they made poor choices. The more you can communicate to people, it's so easy to get most people on board with something if you actually explain it to them. That's true. Just two seconds. My computer has been messing up this entire time. We're still recording the audio, which is good. For some reason, this is not working. And I apologize. So I have one last question for you. One last line of questions, I should say. And I want to start by asking this. What do you boast about when it comes to your community? What's the thing that when you come talk to municipal leaders from across Manitoba, you say, you know what, you're doing it right. My community is doing it better. What's that thing for you? you know, I think for us, more and more working together with our neighbors. There was a time when there used to be seven municipalities and through amalgamation that became four. 
And there were some wars over the years. And that cost us energy, it cost us money, it cost us time in getting better. We're doing better, much better at working together. And because we're working together, we have things to show for it. So I can invite you to come ride a train in my municipality because we have a miniature train ride at our museum. We can, Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, we can invite you to come skiing at some place that's the biggest ski hill this side of the Rocky Mountains and has a chalet that looks like you're in Alberta. And not only do we have that, it was paid for before it was built with not a single municipal dollar because we have a community that can accomplish amazing things and does. We have this amazing little utopia where you can come and be a part of it for a while and fall in love and stay. So... I think the last question I have, and it's the question that I ask every single municipal leader, because I think they know how to answer it, but I just want to put it on the record. What makes the municipality of Swan Valley West such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? You know, from a Reeves perspective. From my perspective, it's the community. It's the fact that everybody knows everybody's name. And sometimes that's annoying. But, you know, if you go to Winnipeg and live in Winnipeg, how long can you live there without knowing the name of your neighbor? Yeah. In our community, the neighbor three streets over knows your name and brings you something to welcome you to the neighborhood. It's so very different, and it's not for everybody. There are people that want to be in a big city and be nameless and faceless and have nobody ever recognize them. But then you have people that want to be in a small town, and we have the best small town in the world. Bill, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for taking time out of your business schedule. I said 15 minutes. I just looked at the timer, and we're almost at 20 minutes. But I do appreciate you taking time out of your business schedule of being here at uh, Brandon at the AMM, AMM convention and doing this. So thank you so much. You're welcome. We want to thank the Association of Manitoba Municipalities for inviting us to this year's spring convention in Brandon, Manitoba. This episode would not have been achievable without their support. If today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations with municipal leaders from across Canada on the cross-border interviews or our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can... Consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.